Welcome back to Gastrovision. I am Dr. Kaji Sohail from Government Medical College, Srinagar. Today we are diving into the latest easel guidelines on hepatitis B. Starting with one of the most crucial questions. Who should we screen and how we should do it? According to easel, the first step of screening is simple. Test for HBSAG and anti-HBC. That is the gateway to uncovering both current and past infection. But who exactly needs screening? Let's break it down. Anyone with unexplained liver enzyme elevation or clinical signs of liver disease. Those with fibrosis, cirrhosis or liver cancer. Patients with extrahepatic diseases linked to HPV. Patients on hemodialysis, those with HIV or HCV or anyone set to undergo immunosuppressive or chemotherapy treatments. Individuals with immunodeficiency or those being evaluated for stem cell, bone marrow or organ transplants and then comes the high exposure groups that's people from areas with high HBV prevalence family members or sexual partners of HBV patients those in correctional facilities individuals with multiple sexual partners people seeking treatment for STD STDs and anyone with non-medical exposure to body fluids and of course people who inject drugs both current and former and let's not forget the critical prevention groups that is blood tissue, semen and organ donors, healthcare workers and most importantly pregnant women. Because screening here can save two lives at once. Now that we know who to screen for hepatitis B, the next step is now what tests should we actually run once someone tests positive for HBSAG or anti-HBC? Easel lays it out very clearly. Let's go through the recommended diagnostic step by step. First is HBV DNA quantitative. This is the king of all markers. It is the strongest prognostic test and it is absolutely crucial. Not just to decide when to start treatment but also to monitor response. Now second is HBSAG quantification. This helps us define the disease phase predict prognosis and in certain cases guide treatment. The third is HBEAG and anti-HBE. These tell us about the phase of infection. If HBEAG is positive, it suggests high viral replication. Be in the inactive carrier phase or have pre-core mutant infection. Another is anti-HBC IgM. This is particularly useful if you suspect acute hepatitis B. Ideally, it should be tested quantitatively. Next is HBV genotype. It, it is not needed in all patients, but it can help stratify those being considered for interferon-based treatment. And it gives us some idea about long-term HCC risk. HDV screening, a must. Every HBSAG positive patient should be screened for hepatitis D virus. HCV screening, co-infections are common and missing them can change management completely. HIV screening, don't forget this. Anti-HIV 1 and 2 should also be done as co-infection infects both prognosis and treatment strategy. So, once we have diagnosed hepatitis B and run the basic serological and virological tests, the next big question is how do we assess the extent of liver disease? This step is absolutely crucial because treatment and prognosis depend not only on the virus but also on the liver's condition. Easel recommends a baseline liver disease assessment for every single HBSAG positive patient. Abdominal ultrasound is simple, accessible and powerful. It should be done in all patients at diagnosis to check for structural changes, cirrhosis and even liver cancer. Tools like transient elastography that's fibroscan Serum biomarkers or fibrosis scores should be used to stage liver disease. This helps us decide whether the patient is in the early stage or already has advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. Third thing is liver biopsy. This isn't for everyone, but in cases where non-invasive results are uncertain, conflicting and complicated by coexisting liver diseases, biopsy remains the gold standard. So you have diagnosed a patient with chronic hepatitis B, but they are not yet on antiviral therapy. The next question is how do we monitor them? Monitoring is just as important as treatment. 
because the disease can evolve silently. Basal guidelines recommend monitor ALT and HBV DNA every three to six months. Why? Because the first year tells us a lot about the patient's disease phase and helps us decide when to start treatment. After the first year, if treatment is still not indicated, move to every six to 12 months depending on the disease phase and check HBSAG levels once a year. Ideally, quantitative HBSAG levels should be monitored. If quantitative testing is not available, at least do a qualitative HBSAG. That is the bare minimum. In patients who are HBEAG positive, test HBEAG and anti-HBE every 12 months or, or sooner if there are big changes in ALT or HPV DNA. Now coming to fibrosis assessment monitoring. Non-invasive tools like fibroscan or serum markers should be used to keep an eye on the liver fibrosis progression. And remember, the frequency should be individualized depending on disease phase and comorbidities. When we treat chronic hepatitis B, our mission is clear. Protect the liver, prevent complications, and give patients a longer, healthier life. What does that actually mean in practice? Let's break it down. The clinical course of antiviral therapy is to reduce the risk of cirrhosis, liver failure, and liver cancer, and ultimately to improve survival. But here is the challenge. These complications develop over years, even decades. So how do we measure success today? That is where surrogate markers come in. According to Easel, the primary goal is persistent suppression of HBV DNA, ideally making it undetectable. The ultimate goal is HBSAG loss. That is the closest we can get to a functional cure. And along the way, normalization of ALT is another important sign that therapy is working. But that's not all. There are additional goals that matter. In HBEAG positive patients, Achieving HBEAG loss and seroconversion to anti-HBE along with HBV DNA less than 2000 international units per ml is considered a strong intermediate endpoint. Improvement of liver fibrosis, control of HBV-related extrahepatic manifestations, better quality of life and patient-reported outcomes are equally important. And equally important, preventing HBV transmission reactivation and flare-ups. When it comes to chronic hepatitis B, one of the most crucial decisions is which patients should actually start antiviral therapy. Easel says it loud and clear. Every HBSAG positive individual with detectable HBV DNA is a potential candidate for treatment. But of course, the final decision depends on more than just the presence of the virus. If HBV DNA is above 2000 international units per ml and ALT is elevated above the upper limit of normal or there is significant fibrosis, start the treatment. It is strongly recommended with a strong consensus. If the patient has cirrhosis, any detectable HBV DNA means treatment, regardless of ALT levels or viral load. It is again a strong recommendation. Patients with metavir greater than F3 or liver stiffness greater than 8 kPa can be treated if HBV DNA is detectable, even if ALT is normal and viral load is low. Although it has a weaker evidence, but there is a strong consensus for this recommendation. If HBV DNA is below 2000 international units per ml, but ALT remains persistently elevated, treatment may be considered. But here is the catch. Rule out other liver diseases first. That could be causing the ALT elevation. And remember, whether HBEAG positive or negative, each patient needs a personalized evaluation. And that evaluation is based on DNA, ALT, fibrosis stage, and the risk of progression. HBEAG positive patients are some of the trickiest cases in chronic hepatitis B. The big question is, do we treat them right away or can we safely wait? Easel gives a very balanced answer. In young patients, 
under 30 years, if ALT is normal, there is no significant fibrosis, no family history of liver cancer, no immune suppression, then current evidence says don't rush into treatment. Why? Because although early therapy might reduce viral integration into the genome, it also means committing to strong lifelong therapy. And in patients with high viral loads, achieving complete suppression can be challenging. But this doesn't mean never treat. In fact, there are several clear scenarios where treatment is strongly recommended, like high HCC risk, high hepatocellular carcinoma risk. If the patient has risk factors for hepatocellular carcinoma, treatment should be considered. If HBV is causing problems outside the liver, like kidney disease, vasculites, or other complications, treatment is mandatory. If patient is immunocompromised or about to receive chemotherapy or immunosuppressive therapy, always treat to prevent severe hepatitis flare. In selected cases, treatment may be given to reduce the risk of HBV transmission. In women with HBV DNA above 2 lakhs international units per ml, antiviral therapy should be started in the third trimester to prevent mother-to-child transmission. This is one of the strongest and most evidence-based recommendations. Now, what about patients with HbEAG negative chronic infection? These are often called inactive carriers. But do they all need treatment? Let's find out. If HBV DNA is persistently less than 2000 international units per ml, ALT levels are normal, and there is no evidence of fibrosis, these patients have a very low risk of progression or transmission. And in this group, immediate antiviral treatment is not required. Monitoring and follow-up are usually enough. But just like with HbEAG positive infection, there are important exceptions why treatment is recommended if there is high HCC risk. If the patient has additional risk factors for liver cancer, treatment is indicated. Another is extrahepatic manifestations. If HBV is affecting other organs such as kidneys, vessels, or causing systemic disease, treatment should be given. If the patient is immunocompromised or about to start chemotherapy or immunosuppressive therapy, Treatment is must to prevent dangerous reactivation. In selected patients, antiviral therapy may also be considered to reduce the risk of HBV transmission. Now, I will walk you through this flowchart to explain which patients with chronic hepatitis B actually need treatment and who can be safely monitored. Let's start here. We have a patient who is HPSAG positive, meaning they have chronic hepatitis B infection. Now, the very first question we ask is, does the patient have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis? This can be diagnosed by lab values, fibroscan, biopsy, or clinical signs. If the answer is yes, the next step is to check whether the patient is HBV DNA positive. If the virus is detectable, we go ahead with antiviral treatment. If the virus is not detectable, then the patient just needs regular monitoring. But if the patient doesn't have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, then the next big question is, is the HBV DNA greater than, greater than or equal to 20,000 international units per ml? If no, then just monitor the patient. If yes, now we look for additional risk factors. These risk factors include ALT more than upper limit of normal, significant fibrosis, risk factors for liver cancer, HBV-related extrahepatic manifestations, planned immunosuppressive therapy. If any of these are present, the patient should start antiviral therapy. If none are present, then we continue monitoring. How should nucleotide analog therapy be administered and what should be considered during long-term therapy? In this group, we have first-line drugs like antacavir, Tenofovir, TDF or TAF are recommended as first-line NA therapy. Choice between them depends on comorbidities like renal insufficiency, reduced bone density, special circumstances like women of childbearing age, pregnancy or old age, previous antiviral therapies and resistance history. 
this has a strong recommendation with a strong consensus. Now, monitoring during therapy, HPV DNA and ALT, they should be monitored every three to six months until virological re response is achieved. Then every six to 12 months for antikavir or tenofovir. HBSAG should be tested every 12 months. Quantitative HBSAG testing is preferred if available. In HBEAG positive patients, test every 12 months. Now coming to safety and comorbidity considerations. Consider kidney function, assess before therapy and monitor regularly, adjust dose if renal function declines. If a patient is on TDF, you can switch to antacavir or TAF if GFR decreases, tubulopathy occurs, hypophosphatemia develops, or osteoporosis is present. Previous therapy or resistance should always be taken into account when selecting nucleotide or nucleoside analog. And fibrosis should be monitored. Non-invasive fibrosis assessment is preferred. Repeat every 12 to 24 months. And it has a very strong recommendation. That's all for today. I am going to continue the second part of Hepatitis B guidelines in the next video. See you in the next video. Thank you.